Good morning, you're watching All You Need to Know on Bloomberg Quint Live, India's first digital live streaming business news service, and I'm Darshan Mehta. Here are the headlines. Asian stocks are off to a steady start after healthcare and consumer discretionary stocks lead gains on Wall Street. Reliance Industry reports a rise in net profit for the 16th straight quarter, refining margins though were lower owing, owing to, small, to soft crude prices. HUL reports its fifth straight quarter of double-digit volume growth, but the pace of profit slows down for the company. Wipro may report a rise in margins and profits owing to a large uh, to a lower base. The IT company will also consider the issue of bonus share at its board meet today. And in meeting with the Reserve Bank of India, industry leaders have pushed for a cut in interest rates and the cash reserve ratios in order to boost growth. U.S. markets ended near a one-month high after recovering from the day's low. Healthcare and consumer discretionary stocks led gains, while energy and financial stocks were the key laggards. Uh, Taylor, uh, Taylor Riggs of Bloomberg News brings us all the details in this report. From New York, I'm Taylor Riggs with a look at your U.S. markets here on Thursday. It's interesting. We got a, a late rally in, in the session starting at about 2 p.m. or so that sort of headed out into the close as there were reports that came out that the U.S. may consider lifting tariffs on China uh, in order to help sort of boost these markets. So again, the reports that the U.S. might consider lifting tariffs on China did end up sort of giving a late rally boost to these markets. The Dow ended up 140 points or six tenths of one percent. NASDAQ as well up about 42 points or six tenths of one percent. And the S&P 500 outperforming a little bit here up about 18 points or seven tenths of one percent. And of course, all the sectors really ended in the green as it was a broad rally across the board. The financials are really the key sector in focus, one that we were watching on Thursday's Morgan Stanley reported earnings. Interestingly enough, though, they actually ended in the red as their FIC uh, trading revenue missed, and they didn't have really a bright spot anywhere else. Some of the other banks that we'd been following this week, like Citigroup, JP Morgan, Bank of America, and Goldman Sachs, while well, they also missed on that key thick headline number, they had some other bright spots that could have pushed that stock higher or perhaps gave some positive commentary forward out in, in 2019 that was helping them to able really turn green for the week. Nonetheless, though, Morgan Stanley staying in the red after some poor earning results and traders sort of digest what that means for that bank in 2019. Another sector that we're really uh, in focus today is the consumer discretionary sector it was a big outperformer and this sort of comes in line with some of the commentary that we got from the banks like Bank of America and JP Morgan, which are very consumer facing. They've talked a lot about consumer being healthy, small businesses being healthy, you're getting higher wages and higher loans and more credit cards and more mortgages. That's really helped fueling the consumer and really the consumer discretionary market. Uh, as we take a look, as we're in the middle of earnings seasons, you are expected to see the consumer discretionary uh, come in a little bit lower actually for earnings for the first quarter, but really starting out in the second quarter and going on to the third and fourth quarter of 2019, the consumer discretionary really should be outperforming relative to the S&P 500 on an earnings per share growth. This is all according to analysts over at CFRA. So that sector getting a little bit of a boost as well. And with the late stage rally, I just want to end on taking a look at yields. You have the 10 year yield now rising for four consecutive days. We are at that key 275 percent level, which is so key for the market. Uh, you are getting yields really rise across the board. And that's giving a little bit of a steepness to the yield curve. You know, a few weeks ago, we were talking about the flattening of the yield curve and sort of recession risk that clearly seems to be off the table for now as sort of yields rise and, and a sort of a risk on day. And from New York, I'm Taylor Riggs with a look at your U.S. markets on Thursday. President Donald Trump canceled the U.S. delegation trip to Global Economic Summit in Davos, citing the partial government shutdown, according to the White House. Uh, Joe Skopsky of Bloomberg News reports. Uh, the president had gotten quite a bit of uh, blowback from Democrats because uh, earlier in the day he had pro co canceled a trip that House Speaker Nancy Pelosi was going to make with a bunch of other uh, lawmakers uh, to Afghanistan. That was an unannounced trip uh, because of security uh, and it would use military planes and Trump informed her that uh, she would not go and that uh, was uh, did sort of contrast with the idea that uh, Treasury Secretary Steve 
Mnuchin, uh, Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross, and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. We're going to be in uh, Davos uh, for the event there at the World Economic Forum. Uh, so that led Trump to go ahead and cancel everything uh, for that trip. And uh, they said it was uh, out of respect for the 800,000 new federal workers who are uh, either furloughed or working without pay. Let's take a look at the Asian markets and Rosalind Chin of Bloomberg News just joining us live from Hong Kong. Good morning, Rosalind. Uh, pretty strong cues, at least uh, as far as morning uh, trade is concerned. What else are we picking up today? Yeah, so uh, Asian markets here are following on Wall Street, and uh, that makes a little bit of a break from yesterday, where at this time of the day, we saw them break sharply away, turn lower. Today, actually, we've seen them pull higher. So we've got the MSCI Asia Pacific index up by half of 1%, the Nikkei gaining nearly 1%, the Topics up by 0.9%, Hang Seng and the Shanghai Composite just come online, and uh, Hang Seng is up by three quarters of 1%, Shanghai Composite up by a third of 1%. We're seeing a little bit of change in sentiment. What is moving those markets? Well, let's take a look at the various factors, which, you know, is... Uh, of making plays here in the region. We've had uh, China confirming that the Vice Premier Liu He is going to be um, going to Washington and meeting, uh, with, uh, uh, with meeting with officials there next week. We've also got uh, the GDP numbers, of course, coming up Monday. So there'll be a lot of focus on that because of, you know, we know that it's, uh, China's been slowing and they're expecting the numbers to be slightly uh, lower than last year's. But we're also seeing, for example, uh, in Japan, the inflation numbers came out earlier. They were a miss. We saw that inflation uh, slowed again in December. Cheaper oil, of course, a factor there. We've got the BOJ meeting next week um, with a policy meeting. And, of course, today's numbers will give them a lot to be thinking about in the next few days or so. And TIEX, that is also uh, pulling higher by about a tenth of 1% right now. And that is despite the fact that uh, its biggest weighted member, which is um, TSMC, is actually pulling lower, down by 0.7% at this point in time. And that is after TSMC had actually forecast quarterly revenues sharp beat below projections. It is Apple's uh, main chip maker. It's by far the largest weighting on the TIEX. Um, you know, this is an example, of course, of the slowdown in demand for Apple products and also the global slowdown as well. But despite all that optimism coming through on the Asian markets, all pulling higher today, uh, we shall have to wait and see to see whether this actually maybe can hold for the rest of the session. Back to you. Many thanks for that, uh, Rosalind. Uh, and now moving back to what happened uh, and what can be expected from today's trade and all that's happened in the futures and option market. Uh, let's see, uh, Agam joins us. But first, Agam, before we start, uh, let's see what's happened as far as the commodity markets are concerned. Right, uh, Dashan, let's start with the commodities markets because uh, that's uh, perhaps crucial here. Uh, well, we're going to take a look at, well, your energy and, of course, crude, as you can see, is looking at a little bit of an uptake, but not too much to speak for when it comes to your precious metals again very flattish moves uh, your base metals uh, in terms of zinc that is the one which is actually playing out it's actually looking at good gains of around two percent and of course uh, in, in terms of spots we really haven't seen anything uh, except for uh, in a one percent up move for palladium but uh, uh, save for that it's been largely well subdued when it comes to your commodities uh, but uh, how are our Indian markets uh, looking at this point? Well, the SGX NFT is indicating a half percent gain, and we are making that dash towards the mark of 11,000. But can we see that come through? Now, it was another flat day of trade yesterday. It was very wobbly within a very narrow range, but we eventually closed uh, marginally in the green. Well, underperformance coming from small cap and the mid cap indices with the Nifty Bank Index also, well, marginally in the green, but some more weakness for the Nifty PSU Banking Index. Yeah, okay. your ADRs, of course, uh, were, yeah, uh, we, we've had seen, uh, well, that, that's where uh, Wipro and Dr. Reddy's along with HDFC Bank have advanced. But, uh, well, declines in Tata Motors, Infosys, and ICICI Bank. Let's move on and talk about some of your other variables. And your uh, FIIs, of course, uh, did see buying around 842 odd crores. On the other hand, DIIs uh, making a net sell of around 727 odd crores. Now, in terms of contributors, what we've seen is, uh, well, HDFC banking twins trying to hold up the markets. On the other hand, Sun Pharma, SBI, and HUL barely bearing down. I really wonder what kind of reaction we are going to see from Reliance Industries and HUR because these are heavyweights and uh, heavy enough to move the needle for the indices too, not just for the Nifty but the Sensex as well. So we'll be watching out for that. But what about futures and options? Now, uh, we've seen a little bit of an increase in open interest here towards fresh longs in the Nifty banking futures too. We've seen 5% added in open.
open interest about uh, very little change in OI. Uh, there you have it. That's your change in open interest for your options. Now, uh, we're seeing more writing around the 10,900 mark, both in calls and puts. Moving on to your uh, range. Uh, well, it's a uh, 500 point range, but we're seeing a lot of support building in around the 10,700 mark, considering the accumulation of puts around there. But uh, moving on to uh, your Adani Power and Jet Airways, which are in the FNO band, India Volatility Index rises by 1%, at around 16. Your Nifty Put Car Ratio, very little change there. Nifty Banking Put Car Ratio, again, very little change there. But uh, in terms of others, uh, we are keeping an eye on Hexaware. It was in focus in the news. It's not really moved uh, underlying, but uh, we've seen a 17% increase in OI. Look at Amara Raja batteries in Exide. A lot of traction building up here. Uh, perhaps uh, well suited for a pair trade and LNT finance holdings looking at some weakness. In terms of unwinding, uh, we're keeping an eye on KPIT Tech, Torrent Fava, and DCB Bank. All of them seeing unwinding in trade, and we're going to be watching out for that. So on the whole, Darshan, it was a day where we saw a lot of mixed cues playing out with respect to stocks. Okay, thank you so much for that, Agam. Uh, we'll move on and let's see what's making headlines across the globe. David Inglis and Jan Mann of uh, Bloomberg News uh, bring in first word headlines. Let's listen in. Theresa May has cancelled her trip to Davos next week to try and reach a Brexit deal with rival party. She is also working on a so-called Plan B, uh, which will be presented to Parliament come Monday with MPs voting on it uh, a week later after that. Now, Labour continues to rebuff uh, May's invitation to all party talks, saying a second Brexit referendum remains an option. Now, the EU says it could be flexible if the UK changes its stance. The red lines are Britain's red lines, not ours. And with these red lines, they shut the door themselves. But, as I said in Parliament, if these red lines move, if the British red lines move, we will also move immediately. Growing numbers of observers are warning that a U.S. government shutdown could soon hurt stocks. Markets are already confronting increased volatility, uncertainty about rate hikes, and a trade war that's hitting global growth. Now, traders are factoring in the effects of a closure that's reached a record 27th day. Fears are rising that the impact will spread as federal workers continue to go without pay. Now, the shutdown has prompted President Trump to pull the whole U.S. team, and we mentioned this earlier, out of the Davos conference next week. Uh, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin was uh, was to have led that delegation, along with Commerce Secretary Wilbur Ross and Secretary of State Mike Pompeo. Now, the president was going originally, but withdrew early on. He also denied Speaker Nancy Pelosi a military plane to visit Europe and Afghanistan. Increasing number of empty chairs at Davos, this seems, uh, this year. Uh, meanwhile, Bank Indonesia is saying the outlook at the Federal Reserve prompted its decision to hold rates unchanged at 6%. The governor, Perry Wargio, says rates are part of the bank's effort to reduce Indonesia's current account deficit, and the strategy has almost reached a peak. He says he remains hawkish and preemptive, and that Fed hikes have been priced in to the bank's planning. Global news 24 hours a day on air and at TikTok on Twitter, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. This is Bloomberg. Well, it's been a very steady quarter for HUL yet again, posting the fifth straight gains or other, the fifth straight quarter in which we've seen double digits come through. I'm going to start off with your revenues, which rose as much as 11.3% year on year in line with street expectations. Margins grew higher than expectations by as much as 190 basis points to around 22.4% against 19.6%. And profit rose around 19, or pardon me, 9% at around 1,444 odd cross. Now, we have to remember that given the fact that we've seen uh, well, volumes rise, there was also a little bit of a pricing action which took place, which was to the tune of 3% according to estimates. Uh, in terms of your key, uh, well, I would say segments, beauty and personal care, which contributes 47% to the overall revenues, saw a rise of 11%, and well, there are 
EBIT margins were so, uh, expanded considerably to around 25.6%. When it comes to your home care business, considering 33% of your revenues coming in from that particular area, rose 15% with respect to revenues. And again, your EBIT margins coming in at around 12.8 against 12.9%. Finally, foods and beverages, which is going to be in focus after we have the integration of GlaxoSmithKline's assets that is boost as well as uh, several other well uh, you know uh, brands uh, that has also seen a rise of around 10 percent and the management has said that the integration of those assets is well on track or uh, to be completed by the end of the calendar year of 2019 on the whole a very uh, steady set of numbers for Hindustan Unilever and largely in line with street expectations the lands industry is on a standalone basis and Reliance Geo's net profit did beat the street estimates in the third quarter of financial year 2019. And this beat did help Reliance Industries consolidated net profit cross the 10,000 crore mark on a quarterly basis for the very first time. Now, on a consolidated basis, the company's net profit was higher by close to 8% compared to last quarter to 10,250 crore rupees. So what aided this? The retail segment, the telecom and the petrochemical segment. Now let's go through the key highlights of each segment. Now the retail segment, now that has been standing strong and growing for the company. Now in Q3, the growth was aided by festive season. Now in Q3, the company's EBIT grew more than three times compared to last year to close to 1,500 crore rupees. Margins grew after a small blip in the last quarter to close to 4.3%, the highest ever reported by the company. Now for Reliance Geo, it was a subscriber addition which led the growth. Now Geo's subscriber base came in at close to 28 crore. However, at the cost of its average revenue per user which was now been which has now been falling for the fifth consecutive quarter and in Q3, it stood at close to 130 rupees per user per month. However, in Q3, the Geo's subscriber addition pace also slowed down a bit because of discontinuation of EKYC. Now, the petrochemical business, which has been a cash cow for the company, has continued to grow on the back of healthy volumes. Now, in Q3, the Petchem EBIT grew to around 8,200 crore rupees. However, at a slower rate compared to previous quarter, which could be attributable to the contracting product margins uh, seen in the third quarter of financial year 2019. Lastly, the gross refining margin. Now, that came out ahead of analyst estimates and its premium to Singapore gross refining margin also expanded in the third quarter. When Q3 GRMs came in at close to $8.8 .8 per barrel as against the analyst estimates of close to $8.3 per barrel and the premium uh, and the premium to the Singapore gross refining margin expanded to close to $4.5 per barrel from $3.4 per barrel in the last quarter. Now, compared to last quarter, the gross refining margins were weak due to higher oil production and a slower demand growth in the global markets. Lastly, analysts have also remained upbeat on Reliance Industries given the strong performance seen from the company in a seasonally weak quarter. Along with this, the decision of along with this, the company's decision to sell entire stake in the tower and fiber assets to deleverage the balance sheet was the key positive from the analyst mid said the brokerages. The demerge of these non-core assets would lower its debt and lead to a significant value creation, says the brokerage. Reliance Industries plans to do this through the Invert route and can says that it can discount the future cash flows and it also is open to share tower and fiber assets with, at the, with peers at the prevailing market price. Well, starting off with Wipro and its earnings expectations today, what we're looking at is, well, another steady quarter. Uh, you have to remember that it's a seasonally weak one for the entire industry and Wipro could face some of those, uh, well, headwinds, should I say, as far as this particular quarter is concerned. But with respect to IT services revenues, we're looking at an uptick of around 1.4%. Uh, revenues in rupee terms are expected to rise around 4.1%, uh, and uh, EBIT margins standing at around 17% against 14.4%, uh, and consequently, net profits could rise as much as 23%. Now, one may ask why we're looking at that considerable sequential growth in profitability that is because of the company taking a, a, a making a one-off settlement with one of its clients national grid last quarter but if you put that aside with respect to guidances well considering that 1.4 percent growth uh, for this particular quarter it is slightly above what the company had guided for back in the second quarter of this fi financial year with respect to the guidance for the fourth quarter coming uh, we are working with numbers of around one to three percent uh, on a sequential basis. Coming down to your revenues growth, we're likely to see strength coming in from the Alight deal, which it has signed. And we're also likely to see that recovery in financial services to be uh, to, to continue. The third quarter did see a one-time impact settlement with National Grid, uh, which was to the tune of 514 crores. Of course, uh, 
and Wipro has you know gone through a lot of these one-offs over the past two or three quarters. Uh, that uh, that eventually will move out of the base, and uh, you know the base will normalize. What we are watching for is sustainability in growth and cost rationalization, demand in utilities and healthcare communications, and cross-currency impact on margins going forward. On the whole, it's going to be another a steady quarter for Wipro, considering the seasonality in the industry. Okay, some of the stocks that you need to watch out for in the midst of the earnings season. So, LNT Tech came out with strong set of numbers. If you're looking at the top line, growth of almost 35%. Profit grew 47%. If you're looking at the EBITDA, that grew almost 63%, with EBITDA margins of 18.5% versus 15%. So, very strong set of numbers coming there. Science, it's a mixed bag because if you're looking at the estimates, they come in, came in below what the Bloomberg consensus estimates was. Uh, revenues uh, on a quarter-on-quarter -quarter basis uh, moved up, but uh, and that was compensated by the strong margins that was there. Uh, overall, in the services business they have lowered the guidance but uh, they have said that they will consider a share buyback at a later date so it's all mixed set of queues coming in but operationally not a very strong set of numbers from Cyan this time around AU small finance bank strong set of numbers there if you're looking at the growth that came in 35% NII growth that was there profit grew almost 20% uh, even though provisioning was up uh, gross NPA as well as net NPA were rather stable uh, this time around so uh, AU small finance bank strong uh, decent set of numbers Rallis was weak if you're looking at the profit profit grew 70 almost 7%, but look at the drop that's coming in the profit. The profit was down almost 46%. Uh, EBITDA was down. EBITDA margins came down significantly. And one of the key reasons was the material cost that went up 43%. That had a big impact as far as margins are concerned. As far as Rallis is concerned, the other news is a, a, a nod for a merger with one of the subsidiaries with itself. Fundraising plans by Yuko Bank, uh, they, they, they will issue equity shares worth almost uh, 3,076 crores to the government uh, and they get a nod to raise uh, 1,000 crores via QIP. And finally, a news that has come in on, on uh, uh, the Financial Express, uh, REC uh, is looking to borrow uh, for 14,000 crores to fund, the PFC is looking to borrow 14,000 crores to fund buying REC uh, at a later stage. So that these are some of the important stocks that you need to watch out for today. What are income tax slabs? How much tax am I paying to the government? How do I save tax? If these are your questions, then pay attention for the next few minutes to get to this. The government collects income tax to fund its various expenses. So, effectively, the portion of your salary that goes as tax is used for funding construction of roads, public health missions, government subsidies, as well as national defense. But how much do you pay? The amount of tax depends on the income slab that you belong to and therefore on how much you earn. If you earn 2.5 lakh rupees, you pay no tax. If you're earning between 2.5 lakh rupees and 5 lakh rupees, you're paying 5% of the amount that exceeds 2.5 lakh. Any income above 5 lakh and less than 10 lakh rupees attracts 20% tax. In this case, you pay 12,500 rupees plus 20% of the amount that exceeds 5 lakh rupees. All income above 10 lakh is taxed at 30%. So in this scenario, if your taxable income is 11 lakh rupees, your tax is nil for the first slab, 12,500 for the second, 1 lakh for the third, and 30,000 rupees for the last slab. That amounts to 1.42 lakh rupees. But you can dramatically reduce the tax that you pay by availing of various deductions that are provided in the Income Tax Act. These are essentially the investments that you make over the course of the year. A large chunk of this, that is 1.5 lakh rupees, is available under the popular section ADC. As a salaried employee, the first thing you must do is check your contribution to the Provident Fund. You can then choose from a variety of options including equity-linked savings schemes, life insurance premiums, fixed deposits and the National Pension Scheme to make up the rest of the 1.5 lakh rupees. The government allows for a further deduction of 50,000 rupees over and above Section 80C for contributions to the National Pension Scheme. Under Section 80D, you can take a health insurance cover for yourself and a premium of up to 25,000 rupees is deductible from your annual taxable income. Also, if you have senior citizens at home, you can buy health insurance policies for them and avail of a further deduction of up to 50,000 rupees for the premium paid. If you yourself are a senior citizen, 
the deduction available to you under this section is 50,000 rupees. Education loans are sometimes a drag, but Section 80E of the Income Tax Act lets you deduct the entire interest paid during the year from your taxable income for your own higher education or that of your spouse or children. This benefit is available for 8 years starting from the year that you begin repaying the loan or till interest is fully paid. Another very useful section allows you to deduct as much as 2 lakh rupees worth of interest payments towards a home loan from your taxable income. And there are still more deductions available. A study of the various sections of the Income Tax Act or a visit to your financial planner would help you plan your investments as effectively as possible. There's a lot to talk over the course of the day and you'll find it all on the live market action on Bloomberg Quint. There are also a few good stories that you should consider reading on the website BloombergQuint.com and here they are ahead of the monetary policy pre review on February 7th. India Inc. has urged uh, the Reserve Bank of India to cut interest rates and cash reserve ratio to prop up growth. The industry chamber suggested various measures to ease the tight liquidity sanction by affecting a 50 basis point cut in the cash reserve ratio. And one of India's leading fund managers, Pankaj Murarka, believes that this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to invest in Indian stocks as the country is likely to go to the best growth cycle. Murarka spoke to Bloomberg in a telephonic interview. With that, it's a wrap on this edition of All You Need to Know. For more news and updates, stay tuned to Bloomberg Quint.